Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben Arnott and I'd like to welcome you to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast, Australia's first barbecue podcast. This is episode six in a series that I like to call Comp Ready, where I interview Australia's best pit masters, pit builders, butchers and suppliers to help you be comp ready. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review and share it around to spread the love. If you're into competition barbecue, you might be interested in my free ebook, 27 Lessons Learned from Competition Barbecue. I've drawn on my experience as both competitor and judge to offer you exclusive inside knowledge to help you make the most of your competition experience. Head to smokinghotconfessions.com slash comp dash ready to get your copy now. There's also a link in the description. Joining me on the air today is the famous, or is that infamous, Tony Gimilero from The Beard and the Barbecue. The Beard and the Barbecue started out as a blog much like my own, chronicling Tony's rapid trip down the rabbit hole of competition barbecue. From what I gather, it was as swift and steep for him as it was for me, and our timelines are virtually a mirror reflection. However, Tony has advanced from blog to competition team, currently in the top 10 in the country, to caterer, and now to source producer, with his signature line of sources available nationwide in the chain of barbecues galore stores. Today, he's here to share everything he knows about rubs and sauces. Check it out. This is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Thank you for joining me in the confessional this morning, Tony. The first thing I'd like to ask you is, what is the last thing that you barbecued? Um, five briskets and about nine or ten colour butts. Nine or ten. <laughs> yep. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm assuming then that, that that was for a catering gig? Yeah, so I did, I did, I did a public event last weekend. <laughs> what was the event? Oh, it was a... It's like a handmade uh, market stall event in Camden, uh, not too far from where I live. Um, and it's sort of, it's turned into sort of half a foodie event too. So I was supposed to do both days, but I only did the one day. So it was, um, yeah, I only ended up cooking for one. But it was uh, not a good day, good event. So I sorted out. Sorry, I didn't really want. Yeah. That's awesome. That's what you want to see. The, the big poster go up out the front of the stall there, sold out. Yeah, well, mine sort of sold out just in the nick of time. So I was just like, okay, we're sold out. Let's pack down. <laughs> no yeah. time for showing off. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pack it up, head home, crack a cold one. That's it. So now we know <laughs> what your most recent barbecue memory is. What was your first barbecue memory? Um, my first barbecue memory was, um, see, I, I sort of separate barbecue into barbecue, barbecue, and barbecue. <laughs> so um, you, uh, you might have to enlighten me on that, mate. Yeah, my, my barbecue barbecue is like, you know, American barbecue. Um, so my uh, first experience in that was a little log cabin uh, in the side of North Carolina. Uh, it's about 20 minutes out of a, a town called Boone, uh, which I'd never heard of until I visited it. Um, never had barbecue in my life before, never even seen it at this point. Uh, this is in 2006, 2007, so, you know, man versus food wasn't on yet, nothing like that was on yet. Um and I have friends that are born and bred North Carolina people, and I was visiting them, and I just go get something to eat. And, um, yeah, I was at this place, and I ordered the, the hog, or the whole hog, um, which was actually the name of the dish, not just the pig, you know. So it was actually, <laughs> every, it was actually every, everything on the menu on one sitting. And um, if you've been to America, you know $18 is a lot to spend on a meal. Uh, so that's how much it was, and I ate the whole thing. I cleaned it up, and, yeah, ever since then, that was, that was my first barbecue memory, some little shack in the middle of nowhere. Sounds like the perfect place to uh, to get introduced to it to me. Yeah, pretty much. So did you grow up um, eating Australian barbecue, a.k.a. burnt sausages, or was that barbecue in North Carolina your first experience with barbecue, period? Um, uh, th- this is where the separation between barbecue, barbecue, and barbecue comes into it. So um, <laughs> I've, eaten, I've eaten over wooden charcoal my entire life. Um, I wouldn't say I've ever noticed it until I got into barbecue, barbecue. Um, but I'm a European background, so, um, you know, wood fire and that sort of stuff. Um, I sort of grew up around that sort of food as well. But obviously that being said, I mean, we, we had a gas in the backyard too that we used all the time. Um, I just never used it. <laughs> um, and when I got into barbecue barbecue, I sort of got rid of my old gas room, sort of went with charcoal. But it was, um, yeah, it's, um, as I grew up, still to this day, I still have, you know, we still have barbecue at my parents' house, the burnt sausages, the burnt steaks, the burnt chicken. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and we still have the Italian, you know, the whole wood fire thing happening too. So, yeah. So to borrow a phrase from Gary V, you've you've really gone fully pregnant on barbecue. Um, so my question is, why? What is it about barbecue that's made you go all in? Um, the same thing that makes everyone go all in. I mean, you fail miserably for the first couple of times, and you sort of chase that. Um, you chase that desire to do better. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, by no means uh, was my first cook a fantastic cook, or neither was my fifth or sixth. Um, and then I'm not really a perfectionist by, by, by standards, you know, but I, um, I like doing things right. So when I, um, when I horribly ruined, you know, ribs for four or five times in a row, it was starting to get on top of me. And that's when I said, okay, well, it's time to, um, and by, you know, by that point, I didn't know it at the time, but I was hooked. <laughs> uh, and then straight after I sort of got ribs right for the first time ever, I, um, obviously went on to everything else, like you pulled pork and stuff like that. So yeah, I sort of just went, um, <laughs> sort of consumed me to the point where now I've got to pro- sort of promise my wife I won't cook some weekends. So, or during the week. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's pretty hard. It's a pretty, it consumes you, as I'm sure you're aware as well. And as I'm sure everyone on Facebook and Instagram knows, it just sort of takes over your whole life. So, yeah. And, um, yeah. I've actually uh, had, had limits put on me as well by, uh, by the boss. That was uh, a bit of a hot topic there for a while. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Your basic trajectory has gone from fan to blogger to judge to competitor to caterer to supplier just from stalking you on Facebook. I mean, I mean, following you on Facebook. Um, can, you, can you describe that journey? Uh, how did you know when to move from one step to the next? Um, well, I guess it was just a, a progression as to what I got sick of and, um, and what I was um, sort of wanting to do next, I think. Like a sort of um, – I started off, yeah, obviously a fan. I started cooking myself and then – you know, like I, you have people you always will look up to, you know what I mean? Like you still, you run you're into people like Hillbilly Wes and the Badass Barbecue Boys and stuff. So I think sort of speaking to them, I was like, okay, well, maybe I should compete next. Um, went from judging, which is where I met you, um, to, yeah, to, to sort of writing about it as well at the same time I was judging. Um, the blogging thing started because I was sort of clogging up my own personal feed with a lot of just barbecue stuff. And a lot of my friends were saying, you should, you should blog about it. Um, my wife regrettably said that too. Um, and then, so I started blogging about it and started getting quite a following on it. And I sort of didn't know what to do next. And um, I was talking to Jess, Jess Pryles, and I was sort of saying, you know, how do you get to the level you're at? Like, it's just sort of, is, is that where I want to, you know, and she was talking to me as well. So like, what do you want to do exactly? I go, well, I don't even know. I don't even know what I want to do, you know? So um, I sort of got sick of cooking meals and spending, you know, 30 minutes after taking photos of it before I could eat it. Um, so <laughs> blogging sort of lasted about a year and then I was, just, um, yeah, I got really got sick of that. Like as soon as everyone in my family and so did all of my friends was like, okay, look at this food. I can't touch it yet though. I was going to take photos of it first and, you know, um, so after that I was like, okay, well I'm getting sick of that sort of side of it. And, uh, competition sort of read their head a lot more than what they did the year before. Um, so naturally I started sort of competing as well. Um, and I'm still competitive now. Like I still still have uh, prospects to compete next year. And from that, I uh, went to, um, yeah, I'm getting bigger rigs, getting bigger setups. Um, you sort of do a few events, people are like, oh, can you, can you cater? And I sort of just went to that as well. So, um, yeah, and then that's pretty much where it's at now is uh, 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 everything really um, to the point I'm actually taking a step back from it because there's just so much involved. So, it's, yeah. Yeah. But it's, um, no, it's still good fun. It's, um. I want to keep the fun into it. I don't want to. Get, I don't want to get to the point where it becomes such a burden that I have to. That I have to do it. You know. So it's um. Yeah. So that's pretty much where I'm at now. Yeah. I'm interested to know what the advice was from Jess. Um. Well, it's pretty much talking. She's like, you know, she she um she pretty much said to me like, you know, where do you want to go with it? And I was just had to sit there and think, well, where do I want to go with it? You know, and like. I could sit there and keep writing about it, keep um, keep taking photos of it, keep, you know, just keep consuming my whole weekend and not really doing anything outside of my own house. And um, that's when I sort of got to the point where, you know, it was good that, yeah, she sort of said to me, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much just something I said, take, take some time and think where you want to go with it. If you want to go vlogging, you know, then maybe, maybe, you do, maybe do this or maybe do that. Or if you don't want to do then, and I sort of went the other way. I sort of decided not to vlog. So it's, um, yeah, so... Either way, she you know she she's a uh, yeah she has some good advice from me. So 
Fantastic. Now, you, you mentioned um, Hillbilly Wes before, and you just held your hand up to the camera, and I thought I saw, have you got actually got Wes tattooed down your hand? Yes, that's not him. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, we, named, yeah, we named my son Wes um, after Wes Anderson, actually, the movie director. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, um, this is actually just before I met Hillbilly Wes, and I was sort of like, well, shit, now I've got your name tattooed on my finger, so... <laughs> that's a bit weird. A little weird. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's there now. <laughs> um, and this is just before they opened Bovine and Swine. So um, people sort of see it and they're like, is that for Hillbilly Wes? I'm like, after, after eating the Bovine and Swine, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mentioned earlier that, that you're in the top 10 teams in the country right now. What uh, gives you your edge? Um, who, who, who knows, I guess. I guess... Um, I guess from judging and just being around the competitions last year um, before I started competing, I just sort of noticed that the teams that did the, the best, like, you know, like, like the Meat Sweats and, um, and Badass Barbecue, were sort of quite good at everything. Um, so when I started practicing, I was just like, well, I'm not just going to focus on brisket. I'm not just going to focus on pork. I'm just going to focus on all of it. So um, I, I guess I don't really know. Like, to me, I'll still say to this day, like, no matter what, like, there, there's – there's so much luck involved in barbecue, competition barbecue. Um, you know, because you can hand in the best best brisket or best best handing you've done and it'll just land on the worst table ever. Um, so I guess there's a certain degree of luck <laughs> that plays a part in the two. Um, at the end of the day, you can just do the best that you can do. And that's all I try and do all the time. I don't really try and beat anybody in particular or try and get a score. I just do the best I can do. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's sort of worked so far. So... <laughs> um, yeah, but so you win some, you lose some, I guess. Like I sort of did quite well towards the beginning of the year and then I've sort of plateaued since like July. So, um, but it's, you know, it's a learning curve. Every single competition you come back and you learn something new. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's, um, other than that, I try and sort of stick to like, um, I try and sort of stick to my flavours that I like, um, but I'm sort of starting to wear around that now. So it's, um, I sort of realised that not everybody is an Italian who loves salt. <laughs> So, um, so I'm trying to curve things around that and just trying to, trying to make my taste a bit more universal by what I'm handing in. So. Interesting. Mm-hmm. The last time I caught up with you, mate, was at the Brisbane Barbecue Festival and you told me that that was the fifth competition you'd attended for the year. What was your final count? Uh, seven, yes. So um, I had intended to do nine, um, but no, things got in the way. I had to pull out of some competitions. So it's, um, I did seven since... Uh, within a year, so pretty much since about a year ago, I've done seven. Um, yeah, it, sort of, it, t- it consumes you a lot, so you sort of can't spend too much time driving around and ask anybody on the circuit, and I'll tell you that I'm not really a big driver, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to drive everywhere on the face of the planet to, to compete. So it's, um, yeah, pretty much where I can get to. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, so I was seven, and I enjoyed every single one of them. Like, there wasn't... Um, you know, there's a few I've decided not to do again this year, um, but there's so many more that, you know, I sort of like going to new places anyway. So, yeah. Hmm. Brisbane's a fair way from Sydney though, mate. That's what, eight, 900 kilometres. That's still a fair drive to come up for a competition. I flew it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I flew it. And luckily my friend, um, my friend Nick from Scotch and Smoke, he was driving up and, um, you know, Rob from Radar Hill, he's based up there. So I sort of borrowed a pit off him. Uh, Asked Nick for some pretty big favors and bringing up some of my stuff and borrowed the rest of it off the Shank Brothers and my cousin who lives up there. So, um, caught in a lot of favors, that's for damn sure. <laughs> but it was, um, it was a fun comp. Um, I think I, I think I only got third, I got third place lamb at that competition. Um, I didn't place in top 10 or anything like that, but it was definitely a fun competition. Great sport. And Brisbane's weird, man. I've got a suntan in the middle of the year, um, up there and I was running around in the singlet and I was sweating, sweating pretty heavily. And it was July. I don't know what the hell you guys do out there, but it was way too hot. <laughs> Mate, it's that's the exact reason that we moved up here. We um we moved up here from Sydney, and uh, when we first moved up here, people thought we were crazy because it was the middle of July and we were going to the beach and going swimming while the locals were all like still huddled under towels on the on the sand, depending how cold it was. And we we're just like, "This is amazing!" Yeah, it's funny because I'm sort of jumping over the Shank Brothers tent. They're all wound up like there's no tomorrow, and I'm sitting there in shorts and. I think, like, I think it took about 10 o'clock at night, I put a jumper on. And other than that, me and Nick, uh, who's from Scotch and Smoke, who was also from Sydney, we were just running around in shorts and a shirt the whole time. And during the day, I was actually in a singlet and shorts. 
And it was July. And it was, I came back and my wife was like, how hot was it up there? I was like, I think I hit about 30. I don't know, I must have hit 30 something. It's hot enough for me not to wear a shirt. That's for damn sure. Yeah, mm. I, I think it was 32 or something that day. So that was, um, it was a pretty warm day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, it was a good competition though. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. Mm. Did you make it to Burley? No, I didn't. Um, I did Burley last year. I didn't do Burley this year, but it's, um, I'm, I'm still considering doing it next year. I don't really know. Um, I, I judged that, I had judged it last, last year um, with Jay. Um, so I helped him out a bit. I didn't really head judge, but I helped him out a bit. Um, that was a beautiful festival, beautiful, beautiful place for it too. Mm. Gorgeous spot. Um, it's funny because I can sort of justify driving to Burley. I can't justify driving to Brisbane. Okay. Which I don't know. I don't know why. It's just that sort of bit too far where it's just like, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is an no. extra hour up the road. So. Yeah, exactly. Look, I've got a lot of family in, in the, on Gold Coast, so um, Burley is definitely an option. Um, and yeah, it's, I guess we'll see how we go. I'm, I haven't really sort of pegged out what I'm going to do next year yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Really just came to mind when we we're talking about the weather because for the last two years it's just been phenomenal. Like we're we're yeah. right there on the beach, and it's just both both years there's been not a cloud in the sky, warm sun. Just you'd you'd think it was the middle of summer. It's just been beautiful. Yeah, it's a gorgeous spot. I mean, I was at the first one. Uh, I think that's when I went up, uh, and I think the second one doubled in size. So it would have been crazy to see that. It did, mate. But, it did. Yes. We went from I think twenty four teams to. I want to say 45. That's insane. Isn't it isn't just growing and growing. <laughs> yeah. On my first comp, I think it was 10 teams. <laughs> um, yeah. And then after that, it was just like, I think after that was about 10 teams and I was in Paramount and then there was meat stock and then it was Port Macquarie. Uh, and Port Mac was huge. So that was a big, big competition. So, yeah. I think there was either just over or just under 100 teams there. Um, yeah, I think it was, 80, I think it was 88 or, or 90. Um, I came third, so I tell everybody as much as, as often as I can that uh, that was a big competition. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're the you're the top three percent, mate. Mm. <laughs> just 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 round it out to a hundred and say three out of a hundred, top three percent. Exactly. I'll just I'll, I'll just say uh, right here. I'm an elitist. I'll just say right here, right out on out. <laughs> <laughs> own it, mate. Own it. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> so, so seven comps. That's a that's a fairly high amount considering we had 18 spread across the entire continent. Um, how do you keep yourself firstly motivated and secondly organized enough to do all that? Um, I'm incredibly anal. Um, I have lists and uh, stuff like that for everything. I mean, my house is a mess. My garage is a mess, but I know what I need to bring everywhere. Um, I've got different lists on my computer for all sorts of things. Um, that I would sort of wake up in the middle of the night, think about something, run along to the computer, put on my computer, and go back to bed. Um, so I sort of, in terms of uh, organised, that's where I sort of, um, after a few comps, I just sort of decided to be a one-man show with a few, a few uh, other, hand, uh, other hands, um, just so I could sort of stay on top of everything and make sure everything was going the way it should be, um, leading up to a comp. Um, but yeah, I sort of pack everything myself and, and drive places myself and meet my teammates there now. Um, it's a lot of work, yeah, definitely, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, it's... Um, usually I wait till I get my daughter to sleep and then I'll sort of go pack up at nine, ten at night, the night before a competition. I'll wait for them to get up and then I'll leave in the morning. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, like it's, you guys it's, it's fun. Like it's more, I had a good argument with my wife about it to the point where it's like, um, back going to Brisbane and she was like, you know, how much are you spending getting up there? I'm like, well, it's, you sort of try and justify it. And at the end of the day, like, it's because it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can, you can justify it all you want, but I'm going up there because it's fun. As, as I said before, when barbecue consumes you as much as it has me, um, you don't really have much else going on in your life. You know, I'm still a nutrition during the week. I'm a father and I'm a father of two kids. Um, but there's no other hobbies I have at all. You know, like it's pretty much just barbecue as, as anything outside of work. So um, and I'm pretty cool with that. I'm sure my health isn't, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it it certainly does um, take over in in any spare time you've got. I'm um, I, I teach at TAFE during the day, and then in the evenings I go to uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I train there just to try and you know just keep some resemblance of any kind of fitness at all. And then uh, between the hours of eight and midnight, I'm running websites, processing photography, planning recipes. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to squeeze some exercise in now. Last year, I crossfitted for about six months, and um, 
I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go there before work. <laughs> and I was getting to work exhausted uh, at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, so um, that sort of hit the back burner pretty hard. But it's, um, yeah, I'm trying to find some sort of balance back in my life. It's sort of a running joker in the barbecue world is, you know, before barbecue life. <laughs> and, you know, these guys will love weightlifters and shit like that, and they're all incredibly built. Now they're just like, you know, you Joe off the street pretty much. But yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it definitely it t- it takes over every part of your life. All right, so we were just talking about um, motivation and organisation to get to all the competitions. Uh, later in the series, I'll be discussing sponsorship with Brett from the Flaming Mongrels. Can I ask, are you sponsored and does that help you get to all the competitions? Uh, yes, I am indeed sponsored. Yeah, it's, um, that's one thing I sort of looked at before I started competing, um, was working out some sort of sponsorships for people. Um, it's an expensive hobby. Um, and competitive barbecue, you know, you're using the best meat you can. Um, so... Straight from the get-go, I sort of started seeking uh, sponsorships. Um, we sort of worked with the blog as well. Um, so um, I already sort of had quite a reach with the blog. So I was just like, when I mean, the Beard and Barbecue came up, I was just like, okay, well, let's sponsor the Beard and Barbecue. So Radar Hill was already on board with that uh, as I sponsored the blog too. Um, and I, um, when I started competing, I thought, like, yeah, I need a meat sponsor. Uh, and a place just nearby me, probably by nearby me, I mean, about 30Ks away from me, um, he's opened up and he's a butcher's deli and a cafe. Uh, they're called Orangeville Miko. And um, I sort of went in to get a few things from the, and they have crazy burgers and stuff there. So when I went in there, I started talking to him and he was, he was in the barbecue too. Like he did, he had a whole bunch of uh, pellet smokers he was trying to sell. Um, and then as soon as I sort of started talking, he was like, okay, well, let's do a sponsorship, let's do this. Um, I'm quite good friends with them now. I mean, they're on the circuit too. They compete too. Um, and they're called Old Q with you. Um, obviously, me being the loud mouth I am, um, <laughs> he sort of jumped on board and we both sort of um, both benefited from it quite well. Um, he's got a side a side company called um, Butcher Direct, which is an online delivery service. Um, so I sort of spruced that at the competitions because, um, you know, we're not all around Sydney. So, um, yeah, but he's... Yeah, he's been fantastic. And then after that, um, I sort of needed the charcoal sponsor too. And um, one of the competitions in Sydney, um, some of us got offered a sponsorship off from the main sponsor of the, of the competition, which was Firebrand Charcoal. Um, and they're a worldwide-based charcoal company. Um, they're based in based from Turkey. Um, they mostly supply restaurants and stuff like that with, uh, with charcoal. Um, but then they started moving into the, the consumer market too. So... Um, a few of us, like I think Lucas is sponsored by him too. Um, Black Iron Smokers, I'm pretty sure uh, Scotch and Smoke is sponsored by him too. Um, and they're fantastic. They, they, they sponsored a few comps. I'm pretty sure they sponsored Bengalo as well. They did. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, I sort of jumped on board with them and they're, they're a great mob to work with. Great, great product. Um, and then also I needed the wood sponsor. So I've sort of got involved with a, a mob down here in Sydney called Oz Firewood uh, in Schofields. And um they got great quality, great quality wood, so I sort of speak to them about it. And, yeah, so I've sort of got all angles covered, really. Um, I guess I would not be able to do the competitions I've done without, without them, definitely. Um, I wouldn't be able to afford to. <laughs> so, um, as I said before, with Brisbane, uh, I mean, Radar Hill's based up there, so it's just a simple phone call to Rob saying, can I borrow a pit? <laughs> uh, and I had a pit, so it was, um, that was pretty handy. My meat, yeah, got, got brought up. Um, at that point, I don't think I was sponsored by Firebrand. So, um, yeah, but everything else out there was good. The wood was good. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think a, um, I think sponsorship definitely goes a long way. Um, oh, heaps. But you, you've got to sort of work out what you're going to do with them. You know I mean? Like it's, it wasn't um, – it was pretty important to me that they got something out of the deal as well um, and that I sort of trusted the product. Um, so, as I said, when Firebrand offered some of us, I was like, well, give me your products and I'll try them out first before I said yes. And I tried everything they had, and I was like, "This is a great product." And I'm, this is why that's why I rave about it. Like, it's a, it is a good product. So I'll I'll push it to anybody who asks about charcoal because I have faith in that. Uh, with Radar Hill, I mean, I'm sure the experience you have with Rob yourself, but like, it's just Rob from the get go has been awesome to deal with in every aspect of of barbecue. Um, so I consider him a really close friend. You know, we sort of chat every now and then, and. If you've ever been on the phone call with Rob, you know it goes very late into the night and you're sitting there talking on the phone for two hours to a you know, 50-something-year-old man from Queensland. <laughs> um, and, yeah, with Orangeville, I sort of worked out deals where I do stuff for them and they do stuff for me. Like, it's 
gosh, what it is, that's what sponsorship should be. You know, so I make sure everyone gets something out of the deal. You know, so. Mm. Mm. That's, you've, you've basically just summed up the, the two golden rules of sponsorship. Number one, you have to completely trust and be comfortable with the product. And then number two, it's got to be a win-win two-way street. So. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm very understanding that too. You know? So it's, um, yeah, like it's, it's def- definitely, you've got to have faith in the product. Definitely. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. Mm. Uh, you, know, you can get stuff thrown at you and just say, you know, endorse this. But uh, everything I've endorsed has to be in the barbecue. It's just been... Um, it's been, you know, I've, I've known the products and I know the, I know the people too and I trust it. So, yeah. yeah. How long do you think it's going to be until we're going to see Nike barbecue mitts? <laughs> I don't know. It all depends. I married a greenie, so I'm not sure if it's going to be approved the, sl- the sweatshops and stuff like that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But there we go. I mean, Nike's not really cut out for, um, you know, a bunch of fat dudes with beards. So. No, but, hey, it is a growing competitive sport and they're in all the other ones. Yeah, yeah, true. I know. So there we go. Maybe we personally, I wouldn't care. I'll jump on board with that. <laughs> so, yeah. you'd, you'd, you'd take some Nike cash. Yeah, definitely. I'll take some. Um, depends how much in the millions it is, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, depends, it depends how fit I am at the point at the time too. You know, I don't want to be a fat ass dude running around in Nike. I just look terrible. So what's next for the beard and the barbecue? <laughs> Honestly, no idea. <laughs> um, I still don't know what's around the corner with everything. Like it's um. Everything sort of happened so quickly with everything. I sort of went from a blog to the source to everything else, and it just went um, just so quickly. I, I've sort of accepted that I just don't know what's going to come. Um, I've taken a step back, as I said before, like from the public on the public stuff, like public markets and stuff like that. I don't like I don't really like the risk involved in it. Um, so um, I'm sort of pick and choose what I want to do uh, in terms of catering publicly. Um, private events, yeah, I'm still happy to do them, but. It's, um, as I took taking a step back because as I said a few times before, it, it just consumes you too much, this, this hobby. Um, yeah, I've got kids growing up I want to spend time with. I don't want to sort of spend my whole time barbecuing in front of a pit. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, next year, yeah, I'm choosing what I want to do and um, sort of going back to my original idea was, you know, no more than two things a month, <laughs> which is still a fair bit depending where it is, you know, so... Well, with over... Um, with 25 competitions already confirmed for next year, that's two competitions a month. Yeah, well, that's just ABA too. So yeah. heaven forbid something else start off some sort of other stuff. You know, like it's um, yeah, um, pretty much yeah. So uh, just you know, you meet some guys like the like the Country Boys from Queensland, uh, Country Boys Barbecue, and there's like <laughs> I was talking to him at Kangaroo Valley, and um, the whole thing wrapped up at like four o'clock in the afternoon, and he had to drive back to Brisbane to start work at six a.m. Um, and I was like. I couldn't believe it. Like I lived an hour away from Kangaroo Valley and um, I got back and I was exhausted for two or three days afterwards. <laughs> He's driving back to, back to Brisbane to, to work a full shift. And I was just like, this is insanity. Like it's, I really need a lot of time um, to sort of plan what I'm going to do really. So yeah. Maybe they have a new dexamphetamine rub. Yeah, maybe so. That'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah barbecuing all around town. I do plan on going to, um, um, I really want to do something in Perth. Um, I'm not driving there though. I will be helping out my friend Gus over there. Um, and I'll do everything under his team. I'm not really too fussed about being barbecue representing over there. But it was, um, yeah, I mean, Bar- Perth's a beautiful place. So I really wanted to get over there for a competition. Um, there's a few popping up in Victoria and Melbourne now. So I'll do want to get down to some of them this year. Um, just frankly, because I'm sick of going to Queensland. <laughs> so, oh, hey, 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 uh, steady on, steady on. <laughs> Yeah, like it's, it's funny because I, I said before I got family up there, one of them I'm really close with. And uh, we see we used to see each other like once every two years and I've seen him like six times in the past two years. And it's like, you know, see each other, it was like, well, how you been the last few months? You know, so it's like, <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, so I want to head south for a bit. I haven't been to Melbourne for about four years, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting down there for a few things. You're listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with barbecue pitmaster Ben Arnott. What I brought you in here to, to talk about today, Tony, is rubs and sauces. And uh, we're, we're going to get to sauces a bit later on, considering you're a bit of a saucier, as I've coined the phrase. That's so, Sauce Lord, I'll have you know. Oh, sauce Lord. Okay. <laughs> sauce Lord. I was going to start a, uh, start a hashtag campaign, Saucier, but uh, <laughs> Sauce Lord certainly is, uh, uh, is going to stand out in the pop culture a little bit better, isn't it? <laughs> 
So just in case there's any, uh, any cubies out there, can you explain what a rub is, what it does, and why it's important? Yeah, definitely. A, a rub is a, a combination of seasonings um, and ingredients um, that gives the, the meat another layer of taste, um, you know, sort of depending what you're using, uh, what, what meat you're using too. Um, pretty much you just, yeah, you can pretty much coat the meat with it. And um, the, 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 the ingredients in the rub will infuse with the meat while it's cooking. Um, depending on what you're cooking, you'll form a bark. Um, and it'll give, yeah, pretty much give the meat another layer of taste. Um, you know, barbecue rub is pretty inherently pretty basic usually. Um, they get pretty crazy sometimes, but um, I guess, yeah, I guess starting off simple and working your way up to your own taste is, yeah, is what a rub should be. Do you prefer dry rubs or wet rubs? <laughs> That's a pretty funny question. Um, <laughs> um, definitely dry rubs. Um, I tr- I've tried a few wet rubs. And I'm trying to I'm trying to keep this PC, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um de- yeah definitely de- definitely a dry rub man. A wet rub would get a bit too messy for my liking. For the same reason, I don't use mustard to apply it. But it's um yeah de- definitely a dry rub person. That's interesting. The um it's a pretty common thing when you're reading around on the internet to cover the meat in mustard first and then put on your dry rub. Now you just said that you don't use the mustard. Why is that? Um, I just found it to be a, a, a waste of mustard and B, to be too messy. Um, obviously, as you said on the internet, when I first started, I was sort of looking around and everyone's like, mustard this, mustard that. And um, I didn't really notice the taste difference. Um, I didn't know, that's, that's pretty much, that's set in stone that it's not going to taste any different from the mustard. But it's, um, I just found it way too messy. And then I sort of stopped using that mustard altogether and I started just using nothing, <laughs> just letting the meat stick to it. Um, and then I started using oil. Um, so when I remember, I use oil and when I don't, I just don't use it. So I, I save mustard for burgers and hot dogs and stuff, man, good stuff. I'm just wasting it on meat. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, that's interesting that you say that cause I, uh, I've, I've stopped using mustard as well. I'll just, um, put the rub on the meat and then let the meat juices sort of soak through and then put some more on and let yeah. that soak through. And then I just keep going until it stops soaking. Through. <laughs> that's my, yeah. that's my rub. So. That's pretty cool. I, I usually don't have the uh, the patience for something like that. <laughs> so I just stick it on and that's uh, that's it. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. All right. Yeah. Well, I actually learned that from Tuffy Stone. So it's um, I was his assistant at, when he came out for Mixed Stock this year. Um, that's right. What was that like? like? Amazing. <laughs> it was um, such a genuine, nice guy too, man. Like you sort of, yeah, I mean, like it's... Um, Someone of that caliber and that and that uh, that sort of celebrity status, you think you know, he's such a nice guy. Like he's <laughs> probably nicer than half the dudes I met in the barbecue circuit. Like he's just such a, a great guy. And um, yeah, really, it's funny because you sort of think someone who makes such a living out of it like he does will be over talking about it. But you know, you, you talk about barbecue before the class started. You talk about barbecue while it was on. You talk about barbecue after the class finished. You talk about barbecue while you're at dinner with him. And um, you know, you can tell that passion sort of runs pretty deep. In, uh, in a few people. So when you sort of meet someone else who, who is like that too, then you just start talking back and forth and conversations about barbecue all the time. So, but yeah, when I was doing his classes, you know, getting ready for it with him, he was um, saying he just uses a drop of oil. And after that, I was like, that makes so much more sense than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but by, like, by that point, I'd already started using, you know, I already stopped using mustard years ago. So um, mustard wasn't on the cards anyway, but yeah. But yeah, you know, whatever you know, whatever floats your boat. Really, if you want to have to use mustard, use mustard. <laughs> you know, that's the good thing about rubs and barbecue, and 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 yeah, I guess barbecue as a whole is you just find what works for you. If you're happy with it, happy with it. What oil do you use? Um, I use peanut oil, um, just because it's around and it's high smoke as well, and because it's what Tuffy used. <laughs> so I was like, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to keep using that because that's what Tuffy used. So. Um, yeah, but pretty much whatever I have. I mean, like sometimes you can't get a hold of a peanut oil, so I just use olive oil. It's just, pretty, it's just an adhesive. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have a taste because you're not really – you're not coating the meat. You're pretty much doing a few drops, like not even a teaspoon of oil on the whole on the whole thing. So it's um, just, as, just, as, just an adhesive pretty much. So, yeah. This question's probably a bit um, a bit outside of your your domain, but it just occurred to me, if you're using peanut oil – and the judges' tables are all completely randomised. Is there a risk there of giving someone an anaphylactic shock? 
I don't know. I, I think it's just. Um, well, I think the thing that's run over in the judges course, I think, was um, sensitivity slider. Um, because people use MSGs and people are sensitive to that too. Mm. Um, you know, um, I guess I don't know. Well, they're not like saying not to use any sort of uh, what's the word for it? Any um, I'll show you the word for it. Uh, this is keep on mind. You know, any sort of high allergy foods, allergens. That's it. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, we're not told not to use any of that. So I'm pretty sure it's all been run over through the judging course. Make sure, like, if I guess if you are sensitive to it, you probably shouldn't judge because people use people use pecan stuff as well. That's a good point. That's a good yeah, point. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I remember when I did my judges course a long time ago. I'm pretty sure they mentioned something about that. Like, be sensitive to any sort of food, and maybe don't do it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, oh, that's good. That's good. All right. Yeah, I just, just occurred to me just then, or just when you said peanut oil. Mm. So, which types of flavors of rubs match with which meats? It's a bit of a bit of a big question. I guess what I'm asking is, what's the difference between a chicken rub and a beef rub, or can you just put any rub on any meat? Um, I don't really like mixing sugar with beef. Um, when I was sort of trying to formulate my um, my brisket competition uh, rub, I sort of went through a whole thing. Um, of trying it with this and that and um, I found sugar sort of left a taste with it that I really did not like whatsoever so I sort of exclude sugar from most beef stuff uh, in terms of a rub um, if there's a sauce involved later on after the fact then yeah but as, as some, some, know, some doesn't gel with it as a rub that I don't, I don't like um, so I'll use I sort of tend to exclude sugar from, from beef rubs but it's um, with with white meat, you know, sugar works really well, so that's sort of where that it goes to that instead. Um, I guess pretty much that, 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 that's the difference between the two for me is um, some of them, yeah, across the board, rubs. Um, some people like that. Um, I'm just going to finish. I can taste the sugar in a rub on beef. Um, unless people, I've heard that some people use it in the in the in the service industry, um, in which case I can't really pick it up there. But, I mean, that being said, I mean, there's a lot of rub. There's a lot more flavour and a lot more rub going into competition stuff than there is in service food. So if people sort of sprinkle it with sugar or something like that for, for, for a bark or something like that, that's, um, I can't taste it. It doesn't bother me anyway. But when you're using a couple of tablespoons per brisket, um, I think I'll, I'll definitely pick it up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm sort of a fan of that. Um, so I said I keep sweet for, for white meat and I'll keep, you know, savoury for, for, for red meat. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Now you mentioned um, using slightly different flavor profiles for competition. So when stepping up to competition level, what should people be looking for in a competition rub? Um, when I first started, I thought it was more about the flavor than anything else. Um, the last few competitions have sort of proved me wrong on that. Um, so I guess I like my methods and my rubs and my sauces are completely separate between service and, um, and competition stuff. It's completely two different, two different animals to me. Um, everything's done different, completely upside down. So, like, for example, my brisket rub in competition has got about 10 ingredients in it. And um, my brisket rub in service has got three. So it's um, pretty much, I'll try and keep everything separate. My white meat stuff, I might do a bit bit similar. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, pretty much, you need something to stand out a bit. You, you don't want the same old stuff landing on the judges table. Um, so I use a lot of ingredients that um, will stand out a bit for me. So my little taste of someone's tongue is like, I know that flavour, it works well with the other ones, but what is it? And it's intriguing, you know? So it's, um, whereas server stuff is just like, get it on, get it out, cook it, you know? So it's, um, you just sort of need to be a bit more precise with your, with your, with your, your, your competition stuff. Uh, that, that, that's what I found at least, you know? So that, that's me personal. Yeah. As I said, it's sort of worked well going, really flavorful for the first part of the, part of the season and I'm not really sure what happened the last season but after Port Macquarie and Brisbane I sort of changed a few things up and it hasn't really worked in my favor so I'll get back to the old way who knows hmm. maybe if it ain't broke yeah exactly yeah well uh, you just sort of try new things you know I mean you think you can do better um, I sort of jokingly call myself third place Tony because <laughs> everything I sort of had was like um, the bulk of my trophies are third place <laughs> Um, which I'm happy with. It's funny, you know. Um, it's consistent. Yeah, it's sort of trying, so you, like, you try and do that next step to try and make it. Maybe you should be better than that, you know. Because I've got first and place, first and second place. For it. Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, the bulk of them are around the third place area, which um, is a bit of a joke in the circuit too. I'm pretty happy with that. I don't care. I can, I can take as I can take as good as I give it. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so for uh, for people that are getting into competitions for the first time, um, would you recommend that they look for a store-bought rub or just get straight into it and try to make their own? Um, I'm going to straight into it and make my own. Um, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Like I know a few guys that just use store-boughts and they mix the store-boughts together. Um, I'm sort of not really sure where I want to go with that. I just I, 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 to the point. Um, of handing in something that could very well be the exact same as something, something else is handing in. So I sort of like my own flavours and stuff to be different because, um, I, yeah, I don't want to be handing in the exact same stuff as the person next to me. So I try and keep it, um, I try to keep it my own, but now I'm starting to incorporate storeboards as a blend um, with stuff I make as well. So um, I guess the next few months I'm just going to be knocking down as well and just sort of working out what I can use. Like I've... Um, I'll pay out Lucas a fair bit for, um, for using store bought for everything, but it's, um, it's a joke. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, yeah, he's obviously done pretty well with it. So it's, um, I've sort of am- amassing a collection of store bought stuff, which I haven't done since I've, since I first went to barbecue and I was buying stuff over from the States, you know? So I've, I've sort of just collecting a whole bunch of them and sort of seeing what works. Um, I've got my own sort of shelf in the pantry that's just sort of full of the brimmer stuff. So I've got boxes in this room here that's full of the brimmer stuff. It's just buying everything. <laughs> I was going to say, it looks like you've turned that room into a pantry for barbecue. Yeah, well, you can't actually see it, but the cupboard next to me is my sauce cupboard. Uh, and by cupboard, I mean it's a five-tier shelf that's full of the room of everything. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, but it's just even stuff like this is, uh, like, this is all just different injections for me to try. Wow, what's that, a, like a 15-litre plastic box container? Yeah, thing? it's like 18-litre, yeah. And it's got... Um, that's got about six different injections from about three different brands. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, this, and then I've got 45 kilos of brown sugar on that shelf too. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, quite, quite the, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a 50 litre pot where I'm talking about that I don't use either. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so what would be your advice then to people that are looking to make their own rub? Um, start with the base rub. Start with something you find on the internet. And then this, the, your generic barbecue rub is quite, um, it's quite good. You know what I mean? So sort of go off that where you want to work with and where you want to take off. You know, like that's, like that's what I've pretty much done with all my, all my rubs. I sort of find something online and just take and subtract. It's find what works for your taste, really. Like it's, um, you know what I mean? Unless you sort of want to, like, unless it's brisket, we sort of just go with salt and pepper and then work your way up to different ratios and stuff. You know, like it's, um, um, yeah, pretty much just <laughs> find something you're happy to work with as a base and then go off that and um, don't be afraid to change. You know, like it's not um, it's not a matter of, um, you know, this tastes good once because there's so much different contributing factors in the cook that could make something taste good or bad. You know, so it's, um, yeah, I guess just try and find something and just go with that. Excellent. Now, we sort of briefly touched on this a little bit before. How do you like to put on the rub? Are you a sprinkle and pat guy or a dump and rub guy? Uh, sprinkle and pat. Uh, definitely I'm a patter. Um, and by pat, I sort of mean push. <laughs> so I'll sort of get on top of the meat and put a little weight behind it and actually push it into the meat. Um, rubbing got a bit messy. Um, I was, I, it wasn't really sticking on the way I wanted it to. Um, so I sort of try and keep one hand filthy and one hand clean. And I was sort of... Um, Dump it on and push it on with the other hand. Unless my competition where someone else holds a brisket or whatever like that, then I sort of just um, go all in. But it's um, yeah, def- definitely a patter. We start rubbing it, it just gets everywhere and it gets messy. I'm not a fan of messy unless it's this room. But it's, um, yeah, so um, as I try and keep everything as 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 rounded as possible. And you're going to get everywhere. You're going to get all over your clothes. You're going to get all over your table. You're going to get all over your knives. You're going to get all over your barbecue. So just keep it simple. <laughs> Rub and pat. Uh, Awesome. And how do you know when it's enough? Um, I guess sort of similar to what you were saying before about when you said the meats are taking it in. Um, competition stuff, I tend to go a lot heavier uh, with my rub. Um, so I guess just by looking at it, by eyeballing it, you can tell. Um, one thing I've also found is that, uh, no matter, especially with big cuts like shoulders and, and butts and, uh, and briskets, your meats, your rub's never going to penetrate more than, you know, 10 mil into the meat, if that, absolute maximum. Um, so you can put as much as you want on, but at the end of the day, it's sort of, it's not going to get that far inside the meat anyway. Um, so, as I said, just by eyeballing it, like with pork, with service pork, 
I feel like I should sprinkle it on and put it in my smoker, really. But competition pork, I'll, you can't even tell it's pork. It just looks like an orange soccer ball by the time I'm done with it, you know? So, <laughs> um, I guess that's just, you know, as I said, there's two different things, two different beasts, competition and, and service for me. So, it's, um, I treat it both separately, too. Yeah. Awesome. Now, we can't talk rubs without sources. And as we were talking before, you are the source lord, the, the saucier. So, I've got a couple of questions here to... Uh, to grill you on, if you'll pardon the pun. You're yeah, right. <laughs> when we're talking competition sources, we're talking more than just the regular squeeze bottle of tomato or barbecue from the supermarket. What makes a competition source a competition source? Um, well, I, I use my source in competition. I sort of alter it a bit, though, um, to include stuff I don't usually include in the shops. Um, I sort of run with more glaze-type food. Um, in, in, in white meats um, just because I like to be able to see the meat not just a uh, you know sort of a, a sort of big paddling of sauce on top of it um, so I guess like it stands out as well uh, something that runs with the flavour you're having uh, on the rub as I said before I'm quite salty so a lot of my rubs are, a lot of my sauces are quite sweet just to sort of combat the salt um, but yeah it's um, yeah like it's as I said, I've, 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 done, I've used stuff in competitions straight out of the bottle. Uh, like, uh, I think Meat Mitch Womp, Womp, whatever, whatever the hell it's called, I've used that straight out of the bottle of competitions. Um, and I started formulating my own, my own glazes and my own sauces. Now I pretty much stick between them two. Um, again, I sort of separate between white meat and red meat um, in terms of everything. So, yeah, I, I don't see a point in glazing red meat um, just because it sort of ends up looking different anyway. So, yeah. So what should people be looking for in, in a competition source? Um, something that complements the, the rub, something that complements the meat, definitely. Um, something that stands out but is, doesn't stand out too much. <laughs> um, this is the, you know, the burden of competition cooking is um, you don't have too much flavour, <laughs> you don't have too little flavour. Um, something that sort of is going to taste different from everything else that lands on the table with the judges too. Um, so that's sort of how I went with my sauce too, it's sort of, I didn't want it to be just you saying sort of sweet with a bit of heat. Um, I've sort of left one sweet and one with heat. <laughs> so I can sort of get it interchange with one, you know. So, um, but yeah, like sort of a different body of flavour too, not just not just sweet. You know, you sort of want some other stuff coming into it. Um, but yeah, I guess that's for competition food, you've got to find what works for you. you know, I've seen people win on very little sourced food. I've seen people win on very heavily sourced food. So again, it's just... It's the luck on the judges' table, man. So it is really. Definitely, yeah. definitely. So, if, if people decided to DIY their sources, what would be your advice? Um, as in for commercial or to DIY at home? Uh, sorry, for competitions. Oh, for competitions. Um, I guess just streamline. Um, you don't really bring in like, you know, 40, 500 different sources to the competition. Um, I sort of tend to make everything at home before, before the competition now as well. So I sort of integrate, that's why I've been mentioning over the, over the interview, like white meat and, and red meat. Um, I try and keep everything the same, just so I'm not bringing a million different things. Um, but as, as everything else, man, just find what works for you, really, and just, just um, try and stick to that. Um, yeah, I've sort of found chicken doesn't have its own really flavor profile, so that's why I sort of, white meat, I don't really tend to think it tastes like much, if you know what I mean. Um, so some of the compliments, whatever you're using, really, yeah. Interesting. So that sort of uh, touches a bit on my next question. Um, the question was going to be, is it important to use different sources for different meats and why? Now, you've already kind of touched on that a little bit, but something you did say uh, made me think of something else. You were saying that um, not to bring four or five sources, basically one for each cut, and then you just tend to focus on white meat, red meat. So do you have, say, one source for your what your beef, your lamb, and then a different source for your chicken and your pork is that what you're saying pretty much yeah. <laughs> pretty much but that's just me I mean, I've seen people bring yeah I've seen people bring different farms. This, this is my personal opinion um, it's not to overpack and not to over bring everything with you because um, in the heat of, in the uh, in, in the throw of handing in you will get caught up and stuff um, and I guess the streamlining it makes it a little easier and at the end of the day, as I said before, like white meat has the same sort of profile and it sort of really doesn't taste much by itself. In barbecue at least, you know, until you double rubs and stuff on it. Like it's not, 
yeah, if you do the pork butt by itself, you're not going to really taste much if you're no rub on it. <laughs> mm. um, so it's um, yeah. I mean, I, say I, try, I, I keep it, I keep it different um, just for that. I try not to bring. This is just from my own experience. By all means, when I first started, they had five different rubs. <laughs> I had, um, <laughs> I think I had about four different sources. I had four different injections. And now I'm just sort of streamlining everything to make it not so much, uh, you know, bringing everything literally but the kitchen sink with me to the competition. Interesting. So, so one of the tips from Tony would be simplify. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, like, has it, you know, has it worked? I, I, don't, I don't know, really. Like, it's, I sort of started doing this around meat stock because um, I was just sick of bringing everything with me. So, um Yes, yeah, so, and uh, I guess sort of done pretty well since then, to an extent. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, you know, it's, like everyone find their own thing. Everyone do, everyone will do their own thing their own way. This is just my advice. Yeah. Awesome. So, mm-hmm. is it possible to oversource a dish? Then, how do you know when enough is enough? I'd say more so the flavour of the sauce will be what oversources it. So, if you have a super strong sauce flavour, like. Like my own, like my sauce is actually quite easy to oversource with because it's such a big flavour. Um, but my my white meat sauce of competition, I was just I quite literally dip the chicken into it and take it back out. Um, and there's a, a lot of flavour into it, but it's not. Um, yeah, like it's more because of doing that, you got to think about that what you're going to do with the sauce too. So because I'm dipping four pieces into it, you don't want it to be super strong because then it will just coat the meat and it'll just taste like sauce. You know, and you maybe taste the rub, you taste the smoke. So it's, um, yeah, I guess you just got to really think about what you're doing with it too. So you've got to get, get familiar with your balance and then work it out from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sort of, um, you know, add and subtract and practice a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, which look is quite, I guess it's quite easy to say when you have a sponsor, but like it's, um, it's something you've got to do really. It's just you don't sort of rock up and just wing it. <laughs> that being said, I mean, I've won, I've won, I've, I've seen people win, completely by winning competition. <laughs> like it's sort of rocking up and just sort of, you know, just, just tossing, just putting, just putting something in the box and completely taking one of the highest scores of the year. Like it's, it's happened. As I said before, it's just judges, comes judges, man. It's, it's luck. <laughs> yeah, it does, it, it, it does often come down to that. Hmm. So you mentioned um, dipping your chicken in the sauce before. Um, are you a mop or a brush guy when it comes to other cuts? <laughs> Um, no, I'm more of a brush, if anything. Um, if I'm not dipping it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess more of a brush. A mop. Is this in competition or is this in service? Oh, we're, we're just talking about just uh, competition stuff. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, if it's just competition stuff, then um, definitely a brush. I think a mop will ruin too much of what you have going and what you put a lot of effort into. Um, so, you know, mops are very messy and so is a brush, but you can be more precise with a brush. Um, Depending on what you're using, depending depending what you exactly get brushing, and depending what's underneath it too. I mean, if you've got like, if you've got a really transparent rub, um, and you're putting a really heavy sauce on it, then that's going to ruin the look of the the, the meat too. You know, so it's um, I guess you just got to find what, what what works for you, really. Yeah. Yeah, because hmm. uh, presentation certainly counts in competition, doesn't it? So if you can be yeah, able- definitely. Well, yeah, like. So- yeah, well, some of the mops I've seen just go go on and it's just there goes half your rub. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah, like people go through a lot of effort to make things look pretty good in rubbing competition. So I think rubbers would be a bit too messy, personally. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, mop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As a barbecue judge, I've noticed that dishes with a semi-transparent sauce seems to score better than those with a thick, solid-coloured sauce. Why is that? And what's the trick to making a full-flavoured sauce that's still semi-see-through? Um, well, I can't answer that completely because <laughs> I'm still competing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, as I, I'll sort of stick to that sort of stuff with my white meats because um, they do sort of tend to look a bit better um, when they're finished. So I try not to ruin that look. That's why I sort of use a more of a glaze uh, than, than a sauce. You know, so it's, um, I guess the difference there would be that a glaze is more so about the appearance than it, than it is about the taste. Uh, and the sauce is definitely more about taste than it is about the appearance. So that's sort of why I keep it white and red meat again. <laughs> ah, okay. I see. Yeah, so, mm. Awesome. That being said, I, I glazed my, uh, through no fault of my own, and through my cousin I was helping me out at Brisbane, we ended up glazing my, 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 uh, my burn ends <laughs> at a competition, and I was like, thought it the end of the world. And some, some stuff just goes wrong. Like, um, 
one of my first competitions, my old teammate, he, uh, he injected the brisket with chicken stock. <laughs> and um, it actually ended up doing quite well. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I guess sort of, you never know with these sort of things. <laughs> um, yeah. So both rubs and sauces are applied to the meat. Is it important to pair them or can you mix and match? I think a mix and match is fine, fine what works, really. Um, it's important to sort of pair to some degree. As I said before, I, mean, I try and go with salt and sweet. Um, but it's, um, you have to definitely try and pair it. I mean, if you have too much salt in your rub and too much salt in your sauce, then you wouldn't you know. Um, yeah, so I sort of just tend to leave the salt, the sweet, the sweet stuff to the, to the blazes and sauces. Mm. Okay, so they, they, they need to uh, complement each other then is what you're saying if one's Yeah, definitely one's yeah, yeah, you're not too overpowering You don't anything too overpowering um, with the rub and the sauce If both of them just taste like sugar then it's just, the whole thing just tastes like sugar mm. It might be yeah. Right Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you've, uh, you've actually taken your sauces pretty much all the way to the top in Australia in terms of um, having them you know, mass produced and sold through a chain all around the country. Um, a lot of barbecuers are very proud of their rubs and sauces. So how, how can they take it to the next level? Like what's the step the, or some of the steps involved in getting them uh, out, out of the kitchen and into production? Um, well, how, how mine sort of started was I was sort of making it, um, I was just making it at home. I was just sort of playing around with the recipe and I started doing it at home a bit and then, um, I started doing public events with my sponsor at Orangeville, uh, Miko, and I started using my sauce. And a lot of the, a lot of the people, a lot of the public came back and said, well, what was that sauce? Um, and, you know, where can we get that? And I went, oh, crap, I just made it in my, I made it in my kitchen. <laughs> um, and then I was, we started doing a few more Sydney meetups as well, and I started getting some sauce out uh, into the barbecue or just sort of like just people, hear people's opinions on it, really. Um and people still, still like to still enjoy it. I started doing more public events and I was just like, people, people kept asking about the sauce. So um, I made them a bit more at home. I, think I was making about 50 a, a batch um, and I was sort of selling about that. Um, I had to go through a food scientist, which was a lot of fun um, to get like, you know, the nutritional panel and stuff like that and find out all the allergens and that sort of crap. And that sort of, when you hit me with this bill, I was like, I'm not making anyone that kind of money for that sort of bill. So I sort of had to pay him back. <laughs> it was, um, yeah, so I had to get a label sorted. I had to get my kitchen approved by my council. I started doing commercial kitchen. It was to commercial cookery. Uh, and then um, I did all that. And then I, uh, I don't know where Barbecue's Galore sort of approached me. <laughs> um, and it was really funny because um, I was used to making, as I said, 50, 50 bottles a batch. Um, and I was sort of still going by cut measurements and like kitchen, kitchen measurements. Um, and they sort of mentioned they wanted to sell it. And I sort of thought, okay, well, maybe a few like independent stores around Sydney or whatever. And their first order came in, it was about, it was about 2,000 bottles. Um, so um, my sort of tail went between my legs pretty quickly. Eh? And I was just like, um, well, I can't make that at home. And I started thinking about it and I was talking to my wife about it. And, um, you know, not to give away any of my recipe, but that was almost 400 kilos of sugar. And I was like, where am I going to store that? Let alone, how, am I, how, can, I, how can I process that myself? Like it's, and um, then I had to sort of outsource it. Uh, definitely, yeah, because I couldn't make that kind of volume at home. Um, but yeah, I sort of went to that. I sort of jumped past the local market stage pretty quickly, um, which I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for. Um, but at the same time, like, it wouldn't have even gotten to barbecue galore if it wasn't for the barbecue community and the, the sort of support they gave me too. Because like, I was... You might see yourself, I was pushing it on ABA, I was pushing it through my blog page and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, if I want to try a sauce, here's a sauce. And then the response was pretty good and still is quite to this day. It's pretty good, but I had to, I had to, I had to outsource the, the sauce making. Um, that's why I've still got 45 kilos of sugar on my shelf here. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, sort of, I tried to gear up to do it at home, but I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I sort of left the kids with my mum for a day and me and my wife tried to do it and it just wouldn't happen. There's so many things that went wrong, the consistency were turning out wrong. Um, when you try and when you go above what you're comfortable with, it's sort of yeah, sort of uh, that sort of ruined it <laughs> for doing it at home. But I'm still yeah, still got a few things up my sleeve. I'm still working on a few things now. I'm still taking a bit of a step back from barbecue. So, so you found yeah. like a like a commercial kitchen for hire or something, did you? And then no, no. Well, that's, that's what I was saying before. And, is that my, and you just handed over the recipe and they did it all for you, or yeah. 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 So they um they had to sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, that was their thing, not mine. 
I didn't even think of it. <laughs> and when I said it, I was like, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, you probably should sign that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I sort of, uh, through my from my wife, I sort of know a guy who had to uh, get mass produced stuff as well. So I went to him and he recommended these guys and they were fantastic to work with. Um, definitely very comforting in everything. Um, and uh, it's definitely crazy seeing something you, you made in your kitchen from a few cups of ingredients being produced to that kind of level. It's pretty pretty intense thing to watch and, and see happen. Um, when you're seeing, you know, pretty much bags of ingredients being like trolled in and poured into this giant fat, <laughs> it's, it's quite yeah, it's quite quite a quite an experience to witness it. Yeah, so um, and I had, to, I had to wear a hair net on my beard. <laughs> That was the first. <laughs> so, yeah, but um, yeah. So before I got to that point, I had to um, I had to go through my council to get my kitchen approved as a as a commercial premises, which was quite easy. Um, but that, that was that was just another cost to add to the list. You know what I mean? So, mm. you know. Mm. Oh, very interesting story. Thank you. This segment is proudly sponsored by Coastline Barbecues and Heating. With stores in Oxenford, Southport, and the Tweed, they are the Gold Coast's only Weber specialist. Alrighty, Tony, in this segment, we've got some questions from the public and Daryl's been able to join us live to ask us a question as well. So what was what's going to happen is I'm going to run through the questions for the people that uh, couldn't join us this morning and then I'll hand the mic over to Daryl who will ask his question and then I'll ask you to pick the winner of our Coastline Barbecues $25 gift voucher. How does that sound? Good, thanks. Good. All right. So Matthew asks... Tony, from development to product on the shelves at Barbecues Galore, what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome and how did you do it? Um, as I said before, I think it was, just, it was making that leap from, from doing it in my kitchen in a small batch to, um, to doing it at that sort of level uh, and sort of overcoming the, uh, the personal sort of accepting the fact that I couldn't make that. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, sort of when you, when you get used to going from like, you know, when you used to make 50 bottles, and bottling and the sort of production that goes into that to making 2,000 bottles. Um, I guess sort of accepting the feat and realising that you're not going to be able to make that amount. So that was the, that was the biggest hurdle I had to come up with. Um, so I'm you know, talking to my wife and saying, I can't, I can't make that here no matter how much time I have. Um, other than that, but, you know, they, like, I was there for their, their first cook and stuff, so they got their food. Like, so their, their taste everything was pretty spot on the first time. Um, but, yeah, it was, um, that was definitely the biggest one was the... The, just the unlock, um, like, sort of letting go of it. <laughs> so yeah, so mm. scaling and letting it go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was big, the biggest. The biggest was just definitely um, watching it sort of jump out of the kitchen. Yeah. Awesome. David wants to know what criteria do you use to choose a rub to suit the protein you're cooking. He's asking because he's stuck in a rut of one rub to rule them all. Uh, any ideas on how to target certain cuts with certain rubs? Um, yeah, I said before, I mean, I sort of keep sweet with chicken. Sorry, I keep sweet with white meat and, and salty with, with savoury, uh, with, with red meat. Um, but it's, um, it's whatever works for you, man. I mean, if one rub suits all, then by all means, go for it. It's not gonna, there's no rules in barbecue. <laughs> um, if you're happy with one rub to do all of them, then, then go for it. Um, yeah, like it's sort of... Um, I haven't found one that I've been happy across all, all sort of cuts with it. Um, at all, and I've tried a lot of damn rubs in my time, man, heaps. But I'm not a really fan. I sort of, I really sort of draw that line with salt and red and, and sweet with white. So uh, that's that's me personally. Um, but yeah, that's it. But if you have to do one, one to do them more, then like, by all means, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Daniel wants to know: after having your sauce picked up for commercial purchase, do you now find yourself trying to better this product line and add to it, or stay with the two sources and keep it simple? Um, as of before, earlier, the whole thing happened so goddamn quick that I haven't really had time to even sit there and think about it. Like it's just sort of until just recently, I've just been so busy with everything. Like not just barbecue, but my own, my own, you know, Monday to Friday job too. Um, so when it came to a shred of, of spare time, um, yeah, I sort of decided to um to, to focus on some more more products. Um, just um, which I might get time to do over the Christmas break. You know, like like lose weight. I guess I might get some time to do that. <laughs> um, but it's um one of those things that yeah, I, I've got time. I, I think I mentioned on Facebook too, and I, I do have something with another um, another product on the Australian market in mind um, as a key ingredient, um, which I've spoken to the other the other product about before, and 
we sort of just spoke back and forth about it briefly. So um, hopefully over Christmas I do get to work on something like that. Um, and then that will be in conjunction with him as well. So, yeah. I did yeah. see that post. Do we get any hints on what that might be? No. No, it's all under wraps. Okay. <laughs> all right. it's, it's all under wraps until it goes. Man. Um, it will definitely, it will still be some kind of sauce. Um, it will be quite a different flavour profile to what my ones have now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be quite unique, but it might not be. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of been down the same line as... Because with my sources now, I use a, uh, I use native ingredients as well. So I sort of I wanted everything I do as as a product line. I want to keep the native ingredients part of it. Um, so I'll still do that. Um, but yeah, I just want to sort of definitely get some um, get some time behind it with with him and um, before I announce anything about it. But yeah, but this guy's very prominent in the world too. So it's, uh, yeah. What sort of native Australian ingredients do you use? Um, just herbs and spices, really. Um, there's a whole multitude to choose from, and that's pretty much what came on my sauce too. It's just like it gives it just a different, a very unique taste on the bottom end of it. But the problem is that a lot of them are quite expensive too. Many um, herbs and spices are not cheap in the show, so um, that's when people sort of laugh about the price of the sauce. Is that that's a good bulk of that is the ingredient, and like not just the Australian ones, but like I use a lot of other uh, ingredients that are actually the real ingredient, not just a fake version of it. You know, I guess, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, so it's, um, I want to try to stick to that sort of, keep the quality there, you know, keep the, uh, keep what I want from it, not just have a, you know, cheap because it turns, turns profit. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, okie dokie, Neil wants to ask, what is your beverage of choice to accompany barbecue and does it vary depending on what kind of meat you've got in the pit? Um, I'm not really a big whisk, whiskey or scotch person or bourbon. Um, so it's pretty funny because um, I'm, I'm, I'm usually in, into my beers. I'm really getting into the IPAs lately too. Um, but it's mostly water. <laughs> I know it sounds the most boring man ever to answer that, but it's, um, yeah, usually I sort of focus a lot more on the, what I'm eating than what I do when I'm drinking. Um, uh which sort of comes down to the whole sourcing on, on meat too. You know, people have the debate to, to put sauce in a brisket or not. You know, like I'd, I'll eat, that's sort of, I'm straying away from the answer a bit, but as you sort of see my answer come into it, is that like, I'll eat as much as I can with my hands because I think it tastes better. Um, it sounds ridiculous, I know. But it's, um, I sort of tend to do that a bit. So with, I sort of hold the same sort of respect to, um, to what I'm eating as well. Like if, if I'm eating a really good piece of brisket and I have a really strong beer, like, like an, you know, like, like an IIPA or something like that with me, I'll probably wait until I finish eating before I drink the beer. Um, so it's, most of the time it's just water because I want to be able to taste the food I'm eating. So, yeah. Good point. Interesting point. Hmm. All right, Daryl, your turn, mate. Hit, uh, hit uh, Tony up with your question. Tony, for those of us who want to do, uh, have a lash at home, yeah. What are the essential basics and before you start playing with different bits and pieces? Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely, definitely. What, what I did with a lot of my things was I found a very, very, very basic recipe somewhere else. And most of the rubs decided from salt and pepper. With white meat, I started with salt, pepper, and, and, and paprika and sugar. I think meat start with, just start with equal parts of your, like, your main ingredients, like your sugar is just sweet. And your, sorry, yeah. salt, salt, sugar, and pepper. And maybe keep it like the half... Of the, of the onion and garlic stuff up from there you know what I mean and just set up what you, what you like less and what you like more if it's beef I'll really just keep it sit, like at home I keep it so, simple just yeah. salt and pepper maybe, maybe some other stuff but like it's yeah. and that, that, I'm beef and I, that, I do that across my shorties I'll do that across my my brisket I yeah. might bring like the whole traditional barbecue rub into beef back ribs because they're more like pork ribs um, but it's, um, mostly across the yeah, beef, it would just be really foundational salt and pepper. Yeah, like maybe there's, a, there's actually a brand um, of rub that just has the basics in it. It's actually called Suckle Busters, so, and you're supposed to add stuff to it. So the whole thing is it's a very generic flavor. That's there for you to build upon. All right, so let's recap our questions before I ask Tony to pick the winner of our Coastline Barbecues gift voucher. Matthew was asking you what the biggest hurdle was and how you overcame it when you were scaling your uh, source production. David wanted to know some questions about matching rubs with cuts. 
Daniel wanted to know about your plans for the future. Neil was asking about your beverage of choice to accompany barbecue, and Daryl was asking about basic ingredients for putting together a rub. Yeah, it's a tough call between Daniel and Daryl, but I'm going to go with Daryl because that was actually quite an exciting thing to go through just then. So it's um, definitely that's a good question. I do like helping people out, so it's um, definitely good to sort of speak to that grassroots level and just sort of speak to, to what you want to start as well. It's quite interesting. Awesome. Well, there you are, Daryl. We'll get that. Uh, we'll get that gift voucher out to you shortly. Good on you, mate. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to, to speak to the the source good, the source wizard, source lord, <laughs> the source lord, the lord of the source. That's it. Hashtag source lord. Tony, you've been so awesome today, just telling us all this different stuff that we need to know. Your advice, your tips, sharing your knowledge. What would be your top three pieces of advice for new competitors? Um, don't be frightened off. I mean, a lot of people, like even myself included, uh, when I first sort of started going to the comps, I was like, well, how am I ever going to compete with these guys? I've been doing it for a, a while. And then um, don't be shy about what you're doing. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, this is going to fall under the one, the one piece of advice, but you don't mind that. Um, but like, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions because um, God knows – Everyone he did, and that's how, that's how you learn is by asking questions. So it's um, don't be afraid to ask and don't be shy to compete. Um, number two would be really planning your stuff out because um, I've been caught up at comps where I haven't had anything, and I'm lucky that you know the barbecue world is what it is because I had no trouble getting it there and then. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, really planning your stuff out, make sure you, want, you bring what you want to bring. And the third is make sure <laughs> I cop it for this amongst the, amongst the other competitors, but make sure you sleep um, because you can't, you can't run on empty, man. You really cannot run on empty. And it's, um, it's a painful thing to do. Like I sort of, I cop it because uh, at meat stock, I happened to sort of stay at a four and a half star hotel uh, right next door to the camp, <laughs> right next door to the site. And um, I still cop it to this day for, um, for getting like, you know, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, like it's, it's incredibly important because you can run on empty and then not to mention you're going to have to drive home and stuff too from these things. Um, so unless you're attuned to staying awake uh, or, you know, operating stuff sleep deprived and make sure you get some level of sleep. Um, not that I can do this kind of behavior, but I actually have value specifically for competition cooking. Um, Cause otherwise I won't be able to turn my brain off. So it's, um, so it's for you or you put it on the meat and give it to the judges. So the judges, that, that's the cocaine. I'll do that with the cocaine. But no, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's more so to, um, yeah, to me to knock myself out to, to a degree. Um, it sounds a bit stupid. It sounds a bit silly, but uh, it's very easy to overthink and, and sort of compulsive and compound think when, when you're competing. Um, so I think the best way to put that in is a few glasses of wine and a Valium. Um, not that I promote that uh, sort of abuse at all, but it's, that's what I need to get myself to sleep. So it's, um, sleep is definitely important in any respect. And, us, but most people, anything over two hours is an absolute luxury competition. So, but just make sure you're not running on empty. And especially like with meat stock and stuff like that, where it was a 38 degrees and you're cooking in the pit and you're on top of asphalt and you're in Homebush Bay, where it's essentially a basin, um, then, you know, you can, it's pretty easy to sort of exhaust yourself and, and get yourself pretty sick. You know, so you're going to sleep. So, yeah. Some solid advice there. I know that when I go to competitions, I actually program my run sheet into my phone and I set reminder alarms on my phone <laughs> so I can actually yeah. let it yeah. out and, and I go to bed and about every, you know, whatever it is, every 78 minutes, every 90 minutes, whatever it is, the phone goes ding, ding, ding beside my head and wakes me up and I just sort of crawl out of the swag, stagger over, check the temperatures, stagger back into the swag, lie down again. Yeah. See, I, I, I can't turn off like that. Like if I go, if I if I'm awake, I'm awake, um, and that's why I've sort of got the two guys with me now, Adrian and Matt. Um, I trust them both fully with uh, with what I what I need done when I'm asleep. Um, and we have a good chat before I go to bed, before I don't get before I don't go to sleep. But I told them too. I go, look, make sure you get sleep too, and don't just stay awake between like you know, eleven to four a.m. because you bend yourself out. You only go back to sleep at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it's um, yeah. So make sure you get some sort of rest, and um. Yeah, I mean, I try, and be, I try and be fair with them too. Like, it's not just, you know, people are putting a lot of effort into it. So, sleeping is definitely important. But I said, I my phone, I think I put up a screenshot of it on Instagram a long ago. It was like, I think it was about 14 different alarms. So, <laughs> that's, that's just how it is. You've got to approach it. You know, you've got to, you've got to be organized. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
All right, before we finish up this, uh, this interview today, I'd like to throw the mic over to you to give some shout outs to anybody that you want to say thanks to, and then make sure you tell everybody where they can track you down on the interwebs. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, look, I'll, think, I'll start off by thanking the ABA uh, for making barbecue what it is now uh, in this country. Um, they've sort of given everyone a platform to speak and, and share and, um, and help each other out. Um, definitely, uh, you know, big thanks to my mentors who are Badass Barbecue and all the Sydney guys, like even Scotch and Smoke and Kimberly Wes and, yeah, they, 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 you know, Bovine might not compete, but they're a massive staple in the, in the barbecue world and he's helped out him and Anton between each other have helped out so many people um, that that's just a pleasure even being in the same room as a, with their knowledge, you know. So it's um, definitely want to thank them. But, yeah, that's definitely the work the ABA put into it and, you know, including, you know, everyone involved with the ABA, not just, you know, Adam and Jay or, you know, if they're two separate people or not. Um, but it's just definitely everyone who's ever done anything with them, I, I want to thank them too. Um, my sponsors, you know, Firebrand, Oz Firewood, Radar Hill Pits and... Orange will meet her, push her direct. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much you know, I think. And what else was there? I forgot. The wife. The wife, that's indeed, yes, my wife. And my kids who, um, yeah, they, they get to see their mother-in-law when I go, when I go compete, their grandmother, so that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um, pretty much, yeah, I just thank everyone for buying the sauce and everyone who's supportive and everyone in the community. Like, it's a... It's, uh, it's a very consuming community, but it's, it's very fun. And everyone's there to help each other out at 2 a.m., at 3 a.m., whenever. Um, so I guess thank everyone that's, that's done that for me and um, hopefully I can keep doing it for other people. Um, and also a big thank you to the people who know that my jokes are jokes. <laughs> a big thank you to them. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> all right, mate. Okay, now just make sure that you do tell us all uh, how we can track you down on the interwebs. Yes, well, um, I'm on Instagram, the beard and the barbecue. Uh, that's BBQ, all in one word. Um, the beard and the barbecue on Facebook. Um, I'll have a website, thebeardandthebarbecue.com. Um, yeah, pretty much. There's contact emails on there. Um, uh, also, I also run the, on the online challenges in the ABA group as well. Um, so, if you want to sort of uh, give up something as a prize for that, you can contact me at Tony at a uh, ausbbq.com.au um, and yeah so I've got quite a, diff- a few different ways of contacting me I think I've got five different emails related to barbecue so uh, if you just want to go to the website and just check out yeah there's a little a little mail button you can give me there that's cool alright sounds excellent thank you very much for joining us today thank you for thank sharing you all, your, all your tips and knowledge with us and we'll see you again soon great thank you Ben appreciate it thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions.